Welcome to the Understanding Boys podcast. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the Boonarong people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. The Understanding Boys podcast is a series of conversations exploring what it is to be a good man these days. And if you had a story that you could tell a boy of, say, 14 and he'd listen, what would that story be? And that's really what I'm asking our guests today. I'm Dr. Ray Swan, and we're a community of teachers and parents concerned with the education and growth of boys and young men in the modern world. This series is brought to you by Brighton Grammar, an all-boys school in Melbourne. To learn more about the podcast, please visit understandingboys.com.au. In the podcast today, we're joined by Dr. Robert Blum. Dr. Blum is the director of the Johns Hopkins Urban Health Institute manages a global research project looking at the impact of gender and gender norms on societies. He's the author of multiple books and hundreds of journal articles and really is a world expert. In the conversation today we talk about gender norms, about the impact on them on boys and also girls. And he tells some incredible stories. He's an amazing human being and someone who has a lifelong experience in working with adolescents and pediatric medicine. I hope you enjoy the conversation today. Bob, it's fantastic to have you on the podcast and, and welcome to uh, welcome to talking with me down here in Australia. Thank you so much, Ray, for having me on. One of the things I thought would be great for us to start with, um, for our listeners who may not be um, familiar with your work, is just if you're able just to share a little bit about your story, a little bit about your background and, and what's led you, um, you know, to the important work that you're doing. In terms of my background, I trained as a pediatrician. First of all, so children have always been at the center of my work and the center of my life. In addition to that, I trained in adolescent health and adolescent medicine. So I had a focus throughout my entire career on young people, 10 to 24 years of age. I used to say before I came to Hopkins that life begins at 10 and ends at 24. But <laughs> I've extended my view now to both younger and older uh, uh, age groups. And my interest in adolescence really came from clinical work, young people who I met, and some of the issues that they were faced with, and some of the things that bewildered me. For example, I would see girls, I ran a community clinic, and I'd see girls who would come in wondering if they were pregnant and wanting a pregnancy test. And I would ask always, what will you do if you are pregnant? What would you do if you're not pregnant? And what bewildered me were the number of kids who said, it doesn't matter to me. It just doesn't matter. And I wanted to understand why did it not matter? One of the most momentous events in any person's life is childbearing and child rearing. And how could it not matter? So that really led to my uh, work. A lot of the work that I did for a big chunk of my career was very U.S. focused. But over the last 15 years, my work has been more and more international. I had the opportunity to lead a study around 2008 to 2015, looking at 15 to 19-year-olds, both boys and girls. And following on to that led to the study that we're currently doing, which is the Global Early Adolescent Study which began in its planning phases around 2012. And we really began implementing this work in what is now 11 countries around the world in very low-income communities in those countries, looking at gender norms, attitudes, and beliefs. And what's interesting is that while in many places, 
including some places in the United States, talking about sexual and reproductive health are topics that are taboo. Talking about gender and gender-related issues is something that resonates with everyone. And it really led us to uh, focus on gender norms, attitudes, and beliefs and their consequences. Great. And I just was hoping um, for our listeners, Bobby, you might be able to explain, you know, you're using the term gender norms. Can you explain what they are and why they're important for kids, particularly as they develop? Sure. So by gender norms, we mean what is expected of you as a boy? What is expected of you as a girl? And those expectations have profound implications on everything we do. I was reading an article just last night on the color pink and the color blue. The color pink was a masculine color up until about the mid-1920s. And the color blue was seen as a soft, feminine color. Why would pink be masculine or feminine? That's a gender norm. Why should boys not cry? That's a gender norm. Why should you be tough? That's a gender norm. Why should you, if you're insulted, fight? That's a gender norm. And everything we do relates to those gender norms. Now, I'm a public health physician. And one of the things that we see are the profound life-limiting effects of these gender norms. So we tend to think, well, gender norms, child marriage, girls uh, in some parts of the world are married off at very young ages. We think of female genital cutting or female genital mutilation as, you know, things that happen to girls. But what happens to boys? Well, boys in most of the world drink and drink more heavily than girls. They use drugs more frequently than do girls. They fight more frequently. They die in the second decade of life more frequently. They have more automotive fatalities, both in Australia and in the United States and around the world, than do girls. Why? Is that hormonal? Mm -mm. This has to do with expectations of what it is to be a boy, what it is to be a girl. And so the consequences are profound. And if you think about it, who lives longer? Do men live longer or women live longer? Almost everywhere in the world, women live longer. Men die younger. And again, this is not because you have an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. It's because of behaviors that lead, yeah, that lead to those outcomes. So it's it's easy for us to see just how important uh, your work is uh, in this area. Are you able to talk to us a little bit about what's coming out of the global early adolescent study? Why 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 was it created um, to to examine you know further to what you've just been discussing, and also a little bit about what you're finding out. So the overwhelming orientation globally about boys and girls, men and women, is that girls are victims. Boys are perpetrators. And you look at global investments, ministries of the large foundations and donors. This is the driving notion we have to reduce women's vulnerability. So, for example, the United Nations established Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, which guide in most of the world financing and programming. One of the SDGs is SDG 5, achieving gender equality by 2030. But this 
SDG, and I use this only as an example, doesn't include boys or men. It is only about girls and women, and it's primarily about older women. Now, I don't know how you can achieve gender equality by ignoring half the world. I don't think it's possible. So we began this work with the same biases and the same assumptions that everyone seems to have about girls' vulnerability and boys' perpetration. But what we have found is that that's simply not true. Now, I mentioned earlier, we work in the poorest of poor communities in some of the poorest countries of the world. And what we see is that girls are profoundly disadvantaged by these gender norms, but boys are equally disadvantaged in different ways, but they're extremely disadvantaged. Just one quick story. We were interviewing parents, a couple in Nairobi, in Karagocho, a, a, a terrible slum. And we asked the uh, parents who had both sons and daughters, do you worry about your sons more, or your daughters more. Daughters. In fact, everywhere we looked, Shanghai in China, Kinshasa in the DRC, in New Orleans, everywhere we looked, parents worried about their daughters more than their sons, even in places where their mortality of their son would be much higher than that of their daughter. They still monitored their daughter's behavior. Why? Because they see, as everyone sees, emerging sexuality as this, and puberty as as this target that uh, girls have. And is that is that partly because of the you know the horrendous rates of sexual violence often you know well perpetrated by boys and young men? Is that is that sort of a driver in that space? Do you think that that is? Coming I think out it's of part of it. Yeah, I think that's part of it, but I don't think that's the whole story. I'll give you another example, and then I'll elaborate. I was meeting with a group of young, twelve, thirteen year old boys and girls in Hanoi in Vietnam. And the way it was set up was around this huge table, and I thought it was going to be deadly. I didn't think the conversation would go anywhere. And one of the, we were talking about expectations, and one of the boys, with tears coming down his face, said, help me understand something. My best friend growing up, was a girl. And we lived next door to each other, and we still do. Her parents now tell her she can't play with me. And my parents tell me, you're going to get her in trouble if you play with her. Why? Why? So I think that one of the things is that as children, We see boys and girls as human beings. As adolescents, we see girls as sexual beings. And so the distance between boys and girls grows greater and greater, and you only come to see the opposite sex from the way they look because you don't speak with them. You don't go to school with them. You don't work with them. You don't see them as human beings as you did in childhood. So these are the things that really drive what we're looking at and interested in and seeing what the long-term consequences are of some of these norms and beliefs. And what are some of the long-term consequences? Well, let's talk about boys. Boys are dropping out of school in much of the developing world 
low and middle income countries more than girls. In some places, girls are still delayed in getting into school. But in many places, boys drop out of school. Why? Well, when we explore the answer to that, it has a lot to do with gender norms. What do I mean by that? I'm a 15-year-old boy. My role models went out and worked. My father was earning the living for the house. He's my hero. He's my role model. I want to be responsible. I want to be an adult. I want to earn money. And so particularly in resource communities where education trajectories guarantee you nothing, going out and working for a boy is solid proof that I'm a man. Girls are staying in school longer. So you have this educational gap in high school and at university level that's widening now in much of the low and middle income countries. And that's just one example. Yeah, and I guess, you know, there's the research on understanding your gender and and how it intersects with um, other genders can also lead to uh, um, less desirable outcomes in, in how you might see people or, you know, you're talking earlier about, you know, boys having a, a sense in which, you know, they're, they're not able to communicate as well or share their feelings and that can lead to isolation um, and, and other kinds of, you know, consequences around um, course of life where, you know, they're not going to be able to, you know, meaningfully contribute and happily contribute and go in and flourish uh, and help help our communities. Yes. So there is ample research that has shown that boys externalize their feelings Girls internalize them. So what do I mean by internalizing? Depression, feeling sad, feeling anxious. And we see for girls between 10 and 16 years of age, depression doubles. For boys, they express the same feelings by getting into fights, by uh, interpersonal violence, by bullying. And by dying by these methods, automotive fatalities, uh, homicides, suicide are all greater for boys because of this externalization. So we as males pay an incredibly high price for not being able to verbalize and share our emotions. Uh, It's not just about being soft and feeling it's about preserving ourselves yeah and so a lot of this you know just by way of summary you know for our listeners you know we're saying that these gender norms are incredibly impactful um it's not about the so much about the biology it's about this standard or expectation that is placed upon young young men and young women to act or enact or act out in certain ways and the consequences of those um are are having huge um huge negative impacts and that really for a lot and you were touching on because one of the things i think that other people might be interested in is how do they get these messages i mean they're reinforced through technology they're reinforced through uh, role models and if i was a parent you know listening to this i'd be thinking well what can i be doing you know to you know even if it's like a first aid or a, a dialogue or a, a conversation you know where would i start a, a conversation with my developing child um, about some of these things. Do you have any thoughts on that, Bob? I think that the best place to start is not with the conversation. The best, and certainly not with your child or adolescent. It is with yourself and with your partner. And because our children are observers and very keen observers of what we do and how we interact. And if as men, we are acting aggressively towards our partner, they see that's the expectation. If we are sharing in responsibilities, 
they see that's the expectation. So I think we need to look at how we interact with other men and women, because that's what our sons and daughters are first and foremost picking up on. And then when situations arise, using those situations to say, is this really how you should be interacting? And what other options, what other alternatives? Well, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be seen as tough. I'm afraid I'm not going to be seen as a real man. And I think we need to be clear that real men weep, that real men have feelings, that real men can talk about their their feelings. I know in the United States, there are schools, both all-male schools and co-ed schools, where there are boys groups that focus on talking about your feelings. In some of the most violent neighborhoods in America, there are groups of black men who sit and have ongoing group sessions with black boys about what it really means to be a man and how do you show yourself as a competent uh, uh, male by sharing emotion, by talking about feelings, and by not ever allowing the kind of locker room humor to be accepted as normative. I think it was in uh, 2019, you know, talking about gender equality, um, that, you, that you wrote that it was um, important to place adolescence at the center of things. I'm just curious to know why is that important? The way I look at these issues around gender and achieving gender equality, we have a small window of opportunity. Research has shown us clearly that early adolescence, up till about the age of 16, attitudes, gender attitudes, are much more fluid, which is to say, they're much more amenable to change and impact. They become much more solidified by 16 or 17 years of age. And so why do I say that about adolescents? Because we have this opportunity that we don't have with 20 or 25 or 45-year-old men. Yeah, and is that is that referring to the, is it Gupta and Sanyatha's work? Um talking about great opportunity for gender equality is about that younger adolescent age? Yes. And the opportunities, I mean, we know from various intervention programs that you see change among groups of young boys, girls as well, in that younger adolescent age group that you don't see among 18, 19-year-olds. I'm interested in the, you're referring to, that that becomes, you know, more solidified in that, in that sort of 16, 17 year, uh, oh, sorry, age group. You know, we know that even pretty early, there's research suggesting that, you know, kids understanding their gender and seeing what kinds of roles associate with, you know, the genders. So for example, you know, sort of around four, three or four years older, as I understand it, you know, kids are starting to think about what's well, a boy job and a girl job or qualities that this is a male quality you're referring to about, you know, hard and, you know, female being soft. Are you able to just to talk us through, you know, in, in layman's terms, you know, what are some of the kind of main milestone or main kind of key figurative points that, that kids kind of go through in regards to their gender and their understanding of, of self through gender? So, first, I think one of the things that you're raising and pointing out, which is important, is that it doesn't begin at the age of 10, that boys or girls 
uh, become aware of gendered norms and behaviors. That occurs extremely early in infancy uh, and in very early childhood. But the question becomes, where is the window of opportunity to have impact? And the evidence suggests it really starts somewhere around nine or 10 years of age. So that's why I think it is important. And I think that is also why both as parents, as educators, we have these kinds of opportunities. Yeah. Talking earlier about the, you know, the UN sustainable goal of development of gender equality in the empowerment of women and girls. And I think you said that was SGG five. And and we know that for boys, they, they experience increased agency as they develop through adolescence. And that's sort of charged and challenged by social pressures and, and masculine norms. I think for parents, sometimes there's a concern that as, as our boys become young men and they kind of have increased agency, that it's kind of hard to manage, you know, because they're kind of becoming more engaged and aware. They're acting out. And you were talking a little bit about, um, you know, how boys often lead to act out through violence and externalizing the, I guess, the interior narrative. Do you have any advice or thoughts around helping how parents might sort of engage in, on the one hand, we want, as you said earlier, you know, that, that early adolescent voice to be present, but at the same time, there's this kind of acting out, like how do parents kind of manage both? You know, it's, it's an end or it's not an, an, an either or, I suspect it's an end, but how do they manage the end? So we have quite good evidence that parents who monitor their adolescence behavior, those kids do better by every measure we have looked at. So what am I talking about? Do you know who your kids' friends are? By name. Do you know who your kids' friends' parents are? And do you ever speak to them? Do you know who your kids' teachers are? And do you meet with them? Are you involved in the life of your kids? This has nothing to do about income. This has nothing to do about wealth. This is about you investing yourself in the life of your adolescent. How do you have conversations? Do you ever watch television? Do you ever see things on the television that you say, boy, this really raises, in my mind, some questions about what it is to be a man or a woman? And do you ever have those conversations with your son and with your daughter about what they think they saw? To use those experiences, never let a slur, whether it is a sexist slur or any other kinds of prejudicial slur, be accepted, but always be called out. So to give the clear message to your son that, yes, you're exploring the world and you're seeing things that you didn't see when you were eight, nine years of age. But there are certain things that you cannot do within the context of our family. And we will not accept that. And parents who do that, their kids, they don't necessarily say, oh, thanks, mom. That's perfect. They might say, Get away from me. Get out of my face. But they hear it. They hear it clearly and it resonates. Some of the advice I've heard in that space, uh, Bob, is that, you know, the alongside conversation, you know, what's something that you can do, you know, it's not, you're not necessarily butting up against, but you're, you're walking alongside. So literally you might be walking the dog or when you're driving somewhere or having, as you're saying, you know, watching a show or TV or you know, an episode or a series um, and, and be able to unpack that over dinner. And, and some of those things like, you know, the if you're able to get, gather for a meal a day or every couple of days, that they, they can be the great, thinking about the context in which 
um, this this sort of dialogue actually might um, might occur as well. I was listening to your closing remarks at the Social Determinants of Health conference. It's back in 2017, and I loved it. You talked about Mencken's um, quote that for every complex problem, there is an answer that's simple and clear and wrong. And I think that's so brilliant. It, it, you also talked about how you know human connection was transformative. I just thought that was such a beautiful point that human connection, you know, was was transformative. And you know, knowing that someone's crazy for you, and there was just so much joy, you know, in the, in, the, in your closing remarks. I mean, wh- why is that important? So I have fundamentally spent my entire professional career focused on one question. And that question is, why do kids who grow up in terrible environments do well? Not why do they do terribly. That's no mystery. Why do the majority of kids who grow up with both parents who are alcoholic, who grow up in very violent households, et cetera, et cetera, why do they do well? And why do their brothers and sisters not do well? And the distinguishing characteristic is that those who do well have one person in their lives who has made a huge difference for them. An image that I absolutely love. I was interviewing uh, an American Indian young man who was about 17 years of age. And I don't remember the question I asked, but he said, my grandpa died about three years ago. But you know what? My grandpa sits on my shoulder and he whispers into my ear continuously, telling me what is right as a man. And he said, I hear that and... It guides my life. And that is a person in the life of a young man, someone who is crazy about him, who is no longer there and who is still there yeah. by the power of that relationship. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, <laughs> such a beautiful story um, and to know that. And I think, you know, it's also a beautiful invitation, isn't it, to be that for other people as well. You know, uh, one of the... Australian writers in this space, a guy, Steve Bidoff, talks about, you know, fathering and that you're not just the father of your own kids if you're a dad. Um, you know, you, you can actually be that for other kids too and, and you know, helping to make those connections. And if you're a teacher or a sporting coach or, you know, someone who has that intersection and I guess, you know, with with young people um, that you can become that person, you know, for, for others. At the uh, conference, you also shared a powerful story of a teacher who encounters a young girl's life and then changes her whole curriculum. And as a teacher, I love this story too, um, to you know better understand the world of her learners. Are you able to share that story again with our listeners? I had the opportunity a few years back to sit at a dinner meeting next to a woman who was teacher of the year. And I said, what? is it to be a teacher of the year? How did you become the teacher of the year? She said, I'm not sure, but I'll tell you one story. She said, at the beginning of the school year, I went in to the restroom, the toilet where the girl's bathroom is, and In one of the stalls that was closed, there were girls there, and one was crying and crying and crying. And I said, what's going on in there? And they said, oh, it's nothing. And she said, I heard people crying. What's going on in there? And finally, they came out. And one of the girls, there were three girls, and one of the girls said to the teacher, her boyfriend was killed last night. Stunning. Stunning. And 
the teacher said, I went home and I said to myself, I know nothing about the lives of these kids who I'm teaching. I teach them every day and I pretend that they don't have any history. She said, what I decided to do, and she taught English, ninth grade English. I decided that I was going to build my entire curriculum of the year around the lives of these kids. And these kids came from violent, very poor backgrounds. She said, so first of all, I needed to help them express themselves. And knowing what some of their lives were, I then wanted to choose literature that resonated with their lives. And so as they began to open up and tell a little bit about how one of them, their parents were divorced and she was sent to Baltimore. Another one where parents were killed in an, a car crash and she was being raised by her grandmother. And on and on these stories went of ninth graders in her class. And what she did was integrate literature about these kinds of experiences. And there's so much literature. And teaching these kids to write. And they put together for their, quote, graduation from ninth grade, a compendium of their stories, their autobiographies. And I thought, this is the height of what education is about. She taught creative writing. She taught kids to express themselves. She taught kids to read books that they never would have read in their entire lives. And within this context, it was grounded in their world. And I thought, she's got it. That's she's, brilliant. They got the right one. And the other thing I think, Bob, about that that I love is that it, it validates their experience because it's saying, you know, this is a, you're stronger than your strongest blow and as terrible as this is, that this is something that you can, that you can use and that you can grow through and that you can, you know, it's, it's still something. It's not nothing. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't, re- you know, stop you from growing. Um, it actually could be the, the connector into, into other experiences, um, you know, on, in, on and in your life, which is, I guess, accelerates that sense of healing um, and, a, and a core part of healing as well for those kids. It's, it's such a, it's such a great story. Um, in your thoughts, Bob, what is it to be a good man these days? I think to be a good man is equivalent to being a good woman. And that is that you're caring, that you're thoughtful of other people, that you avoid doing or saying things that are harmful to other people, that you share in the life of your children because you'll never have that opportunity once they're grown to do that. If you blow it early, you can't reclaim it. To share in the life of your children and to perpetually demonstrate respectfulness. You can work hard. You can do anything that requires strength if you're in construction or labor, but that your caring is what permeates. One quick story. A friend of mine who's a nutritionist uh, in Auckland did a wonderful study. She asked a group individually of parents, if you had your choice to have dinner with anyone in, in the world, alive or dead, who would it be? And they listed all of these people. She then went and asked one-on-one their children. If you had choice to have dinner with anyone in the world, who would it be? The boys said my father. The girls said my mother. That's who they wanted to have dinner with. 
And that's what it means to me to be a good man. I love it. That's great. And our final question uh, for today is if you had a story you could tell a 14-year-old boy and he'd listen, what would the story be? Uh, there, there, there are so many. Uh, the American Indian boy whose uh, grandfather died uh, three years earlier. And I've had the opportunity to uh, uh, rear a son who is now uh, an adult. And I talked earlier about monitoring. Just one quick story from him. We felt we were pretty average, new wave kind of parents. He did not think so at all. And we did monitor him closely. Uh, and we knew where he was through high school. And there was a situation that arose that we contacted him and said, you have to come home. You cannot stay where you are. You must come home and must come home now. And over dinner, 20 years later, he said, do you remember that situation? He said, you were really right. Kids won't necessarily acknowledge if you're doing what is the right thing, but they hear it and they learn from it. Yeah, I, 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 uh, that's fantastic. I, I have the great pleasure. We have a, here where I work um, at school, you know, we have a, a valedictory service every year. And one of the things that we ask the kids to do is to say, you know, thanks to your parents. And that comes up so often, you know, they'll say, mom, dad, you know, those times, all those times where you did this or said that, or, and I never showed you, I was always grumpy or this or that, but I just want to say thank you for that, you know, so that, that really resonates. Uh, Dr. Blum, thank you so much for your time. You've been so incredibly generous. I just feel like I've, I've got all these points written down in front of me. I, I need to go and think and read and, and consider you have such a, an amazing, um, body of knowledge that has been, you know, tested and considered and reflected on and, and engaged with, um, with so many people across the world. Um, it's a, it's a huge pleasure, um, to be able to talk with you today. Um, keep up the great work and, and thank you again from all of us here at Understanding Voice. So thank you so much for inviting me to be part of uh, this conversation. It's a really important one that you've started. We hope you've enjoyed this Understanding Boys podcast. Make sure you subscribe on your podcast app and please leave us a review to help grow the community. For more information about the podcast, please visit understandingboys.com.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.